Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and a very warm welcome to the University of Reading. My name is Stephen Mythen, I'm the Deputy Vice-Chancellor, and I'm very delighted to welcome you to this second in our public lecture series for this academic year.
looking around, I'm pleased to see many familiar faces to our lecture series, but also some new faces. So to those, a very special welcome to the university. Now, tonight's lecture will be given by Professor Roger Matthews and Dr. Wendy Matthews from the Department of Archaeology at the university. It's entitled, Lost and Found, Excavating the First Farmers in Iran and Iraq. This lecture forms part of the university's contribution to the Being Human Festival, you can see here. Now, that's the National Festival for the Humanities. It's one that <coughs> highlights the way in which the humanities inspire and enrich our daily lives. And, of course, knowing about the past through archaeology is really essential to that mission. The university is making further contributions to the Being Human Festival. Uh, on Saturday, there's three events entitled A Flower for Oscar Wilde. I'm not entirely sure what that is, but it sounds fantastic. Um, Home at Merle and War Child, which is a pop-up film show. And you can sign up for those events via the university website. Now, back to this evening's lecture and a few words about our very distinguished speakers. Both Professor Roger Matthews and Dr Wendy Matthews have devoted their academic careers to Middle Eastern archaeology. They're both members in the Department of Archaeology at this university, contributing to that department's outstanding international reputation for the quality of his research and the quality of its undergraduate teaching. <coughs> Roger studied at the universities of Manchester and Cambridge. Between 1988 and 1995, he was director of the British School in Iraq, based in Baghdad. From 1996 to 2001, he was director of the British Institute of Archaeology at Ankara in Turkey. Now, Roger served as field director on several of the most important archaeological projects undertaken in the Middle East, certainly within my lifetime, including those of the Neolithic town at Chattel Hill in Turkey, the Sumerian city of Abu Salabik in Iraq, and the multi-period Telbrak in Syria. And Roger's own field projects have included those at the ancient Mesopotamian city of Jemdet Nassar in Iraq and a multi-period uh, survey in north-central Turkey. Between 2006 and 12, Roger was chairman of the British Institute for Study of Iraq and in 2016 he was elected as president of Rashid International. Now that's an international group of academics and others who are concerned to assist Iraqi colleagues with the major challenges they face in protecting their cultural heritage at this challenging time for the region. Mm -hmm. In 2011, Roger joined the university. Now Dr Wendy Matthews studied at the Universities of Edinburgh and Cambridge. She has been one of the pioneers of, the, of micromorphological analysis in archaeology. That's the microscopic analysis of sediments, which has really transformed environmental archaeology. And Wendy led the team at Chattel Hill, excavations in Turkey, and has worked in a, a wide range of other sites in Iraq, in Iran, in Bahrain. She joined the university in 2000 and has played a key role in developing archaeological science. As an associate professor, Wendy has developed the postgraduate community for not only archaeology, but more broader for the humanities and social sciences at this university. Now I should note that it's no coincidence that Roger and Wendy share a surname. <laughs> for they are partners in more than an academic sense alone. I'll just share a few details and they have... Uh, this has been agreed of them. They met as students. They met as students at a conference in 1983, and they got to know each other when they were both working in Baghdad. And that is where they got married in 1988. They were the last couple to be married in the British Embassy by the River, by the river Tigris. And the honeymoon was in a tent on the dig at Abu Salabik. I am, however, reliably informed that not only was a tent decorated with wedding bells, but Roger carried Wendy over the threshold. <laughs> now, some years later, in 2011, 
they established the Central Zagros Arkshaw project, co-directed with their colleagues in Iran and Iraq. This investigating the transition to farming lifestyles 10,000 years ago, and as I'm sure you'll hear tonight, it's an outstanding project that has further developed the global reputation of the department at Reading. Not only that, the global reputation of archaeology in the UK <coughs> has provided unique opportunities to our students and staff and those for many other universities. Before I hand over to Roger and Wendy, I should note we are filming their proceedings, uh, live streaming tonight. If any of you have any questions, um, please contact one of our members of staff on hand. If you're inclined to tweet, please do so, and use our hashtag, UOR Lectures. So now, Roger Windy, please, uh, please come and talk to us. Well, good evening, everyone. It's uh, wonderful to see so many of you here tonight, a very wild and windy night. And we're going to transport you away from the, the wind and the chill of Reading uh, to the hot, sunny climes of the Middle East. Um, thank you, Steve, for that very, very kind and generous uh, introduction. So, the past 12,000 years have seen phenomenal changes to our planet on a scale not seen previously in the 200,000 years or so that our species has been on planet Earth. Let's look at some contrasting attributes. On the left, we've got the Earth, 10,000 BC. On the right, Earth, more or less today. So 12,000 years ago, uh, all humans living on the planet, roughly 2 to 4 million, it's estimated, were essentially hunters, foragers, fishers, and gatherers. The only definitely domesticated animal was the dog, human's best friend, who seems to have been a partner in hunting and traveled with humans as they dispersed across the planet. It was essentially a wild planet, and we were wild in it. We did have use of fire that had been uh, controlled by early pre-human hominins about a million years ago, maybe even longer. And certainly these hunter-foragers were adapting their environment. They were burning landscapes, they were quarrying and changing things in order to suit their ends. Uh, but they weren't cultivating land in any sort of formal sense. Now let's jump forward to today. We have something like 7.6 billion humans on the planet. And effectively, all of us are living from agriculture in some way, usually totally. We have huge quantities <coughs> of domesticated species across the planet, frightening numbers of chickens, uh, especially frightening to Wendy and I as vegetarians, but anyway. Um, and the land is 55% is of our land surface is cultivated or developed by humans in some way. And the bits that aren't cultivated are deserts or mountains or other inhospitable areas. We are essentially a tamed planet now. How did we get from the left to the right pictures here? Well, that's the fundamental question that we're hoping to explore with you this evening. We hope that you'll leave the lecture with some thoughts about, uh, firstly, how that happened, but also why it's important to understand how it happened. I want, I'm not going to show many graphs, but I do want to start with two quite striking <coughs> graphs. On the left here, cereal yields in the UK, but it could apply to any developed country over the past few centuries. On the right, global population over the past couple of hundred years or more. Now on the left, you'll see uh, an enormous spike around about 1900 in cereal yields. In particular, wheat yields quadrupling from two tons a hectare to eight tons a hectare, which is a current kind of um, average. And on the right, you'll see a similar kind of trajectory, a slow, steady, growth, uh, a billion humans reached at about 1800 AD. It took another 100 and only 125 years to reach the second billion. Thereafter, billions are being added now at 10, 12, 15 years. Absolutely frightening growth. So the question is, what is underpinning the graph on the left, which is enabling the graph on the right? Well, there's a range of factors, but I want to focus on one right now which is the fixation of nitrogen, an artificial process first worked out by a German chemist, Fritz Haber, only just over 100 years ago. And this has utterly transformed our planet in just 100 years. And Peter Brannan, in his wonderful new book, The Ends of the World, calls it the largest disruption to the Earth's nitrogen system in 2.5 billion years. And given our planet is only 4.54 billion years old, he's talking about a planetary lifetime episode of change. 
uh, in 100 years. This is utterly frightening, and it's what we are doing. And you can see on the, the map here, the green areas, is where essentially there's too much nitrogen in the soil now. And of course, there is far too much nitrogen in the oceans as well. And it's uh, contributing to global warming. So this is how farming has ended up so far. Who knows where it's going to take us in the 21st century as those billions keep being added. What about the start of farming? How did this all start? How did this potentially catastrophic trail start out for us humans? To address that, we need to go back some 12,000 years or so to look in particular at the Middle East and especially the area called the Fertile Crescent, which you see uh, in this area here. And this, uh, this is the, sorry, the uh, dates have all got a little bit squint there, but never mind. Um, 9,000 BC or so, in this region, we see the origins of farming. That is domestication of animals, domestication of plants, settled village life. It's important because it's the first area in the world to undergo this transition. But it's also a major area for the spread of farming, both westwards into Europe and fairly late arrival, the arrow, I think, reaching Reading, round about here, uh, several <laughs> thousand years later. But also eastwards into Central Asia and South Asia and into North Africa as well. So it's such a key area for the origins and spread of these early farming practices. Archaeologists call this the Neolithic, the New Stone Age, the Neolithic transition, or sometimes Neolithic revolution, and I think it deserves the title revolution. Although it's spread over several thousand years, it's revolutionary in its implications for our species, as I hope we're starting to see. Iraq and Iran, two words that probably, when you hear them and we think about the daily news feed we, we get, we tend to have rather colored images about Iraq and Iran. We think about all the chaos, the uh, conflict and refugees and displacement that has been going on there. One of our aims tonight is to give you some new pictures of Iran and Iraq that you may take away with you. And when you hear the names Iran and Iraq again, you'll think, oh, yes, that's where those beautiful landscapes and those lovely people are and that amazing archaeology that is so globally significant. Now, I want to stress that the work that Wendy and I carry out is completely in collaboration with our Iraqi and Iranian colleagues um, who are very much at the forefront of driving the research along with us. The area we're working is essentially the Eastern Fertile Crescent in the Zagros Mountains, which are a major mountain chain being pushed up by the uh, Arabian Plate in a series of violent jolts, as we saw last week, uh, earthquakes in other words. It's an area rich in uh, biodiversity, so we have high mountains, upland plains, foothills, uh, lots of uh, water, fresh water sources, and major routeways through these mountains, including the Silk Road, which is later, of course, but comes through northern Iran and down the Zagros Mountains to reach Baghdad about here. Now, turning to the theme of the Being Human Festival this week, Lost and Found, in a way, the archaeology of this region has been lost, and it's only found when people like us and our colleagues come along and find it, and then excavate it and find it again, it, it, sort of in a, a, an eternal process of refinding a lost past. And just to exemplify that, we put up a picture that was on the postcard advertising the talk, and what is actually rather lost on this fertile agricultural landscape here is the archaeological mound of Sheikhabad, which you can perhaps make out as a, a mounded site. This is the very early Neolithic site going back to almost 10,000 BC, where we've been working in the high Zagros in Iran. Important to stress that at the University of Reading, we have quite a, a regional focus on the Middle East and the Neolithic of the Middle East. There's our host, Professor Mythen's own uh, project in southern Jordan, right at the other end of the Fertile Crescent and overlapping in date with much of our work and looking at very different ways of working out the Neolithic in, in that region at Wadi Fainan. Our, our own work here in the Eastern Fertile Crescent and then in particular Wendy's work with colleagues in Turkey at Çatalhöyük and other sites with uh, Stanford and Liverpool universities. So the issues we're going to cover this evening and obviously we're going to go through this fairly quickly, there's a lot to get through. Uh, Wendy's going to talk about climate and environment, how that impacts on the way the Neolithic transition works out. She's going to look at plants and animals, which plants and animals were domesticated, why those particular ones. And also settled life, how do people settle down? Is it year-round, is it seasonal, how does it all work through? I'm going to then look at 
human remains and what we can learn from them about health and demography and lifestyle. And I will also look at networks of material engagement, the material culture of early farmers. What can we learn from that about activities and crafts and so on? And we'll end with some look at, uh, at a look at some possible future directions for research on these topics. This, of course, is interdisciplinary analysis. We have a lot of specialists working with us. We will have at the end a slide giving names and more, more information about the people working with us. Here's a sample of some of the people. And as I mentioned in particular, we have uh, many Iranian and Iraqi colleagues in universities and in the state antiquity services working with us. And we'll have more information about that at the end as well. So in the region, we are uh, working up in the high Zagros here at Sheikh Ibad and in the lower foothills. So we have a transect through the mountains from roughly 14, 1500 meters, the plains that is, the mountains are much higher, 4000 meters, down to about 500 meters in the foothills region. This gives us contrasting uh, environmental zones to, to investigate. As I mentioned, this is a tectonically active zone, uh, 7.3 magnitude earthquake just here, right between the two areas we're working in just last week. Uh, Sadly, loss of life on this side of the board and not so much on this. And our, certainly our thoughts are with our colleagues there. We've been in touch with them and our friends and colleagues are all fine. But uh, a, a very sad event there. So in the high Zagros, we're working on this very fertile plain you can see at Sheikhabad, which dates from 9,800 to 7,600. And in the low Zagros at a site called Bestansur, slightly later in date, um, also on a very fertile plain, a good place to, to become an early farmer, in fact. And here, our discoveries have been significant enough for the Iraqi government to put the site onto the UNESCO World Heritage tentative list. We've also done a little bit of rescue work at a site called Shimshara, which is being flooded seasonally by a, a, a new dam, uh, rescuing the Neolithic archaeology here. But we won't be talking much about that. We have colleagues working on the ancient environment, which is critical to our understanding. Wendy's going to talk about that in a minute. Uh, both in caves, through, led by Professor Dominic Fleitman here at Reading, uh, with his student Matthew, looking at uh, speleothems, that is stalagmites <coughs> and stalactites, which we can uh, examine to tell us about ancient climate and environment. And then we're working with a team from Tehran University on lakes, looking at lake cores, uh, uh, with uh, Maria, a student here, and, and two Iranian students as well, and colleagues from the Faculty of Geography in Tehran University. And finally, from me, for the time being, uh, here's the sites we're working at. Sheikh Ibad, roughly from 10,000 down to 7,500. Best Ansor, a little bit later. Zazi will come back to at the end. And I'm going to hand over to Wendy now. Well, thank you very much, Roger, and thank you to you all for coming this evening. Like Roger, it's been a great privilege for me to work in these countries with the local people, but also the CSAC colleagues and students, to all of whom I'm very grateful and their work is represented here. So please excuse me if I read some sections of this. There's quite a lot I want to get over and I very much want to keep to time too. So in looking at climate and environment, what role did they have in the origins of agriculture and settled life? Certainly, the rapid rise in temperatures at the end of the Ice Age were a major factor. And it's now evident that the newly discovered sites were founded as, as early as 10,000 BC when the climate environment improved dramatically and there was an increase in grasses, in particular the wild cereals, uh, which were later domesticated. There was also wild resources such as trees um, with pistachio nuts. Of significance, too, as Roger mentioned, is the incidence of fire, which uh, jumps up dramatically at 10,000 BC and was itself instrumental in the creation of the grass parklands that were a favoured habitat of plants and animals that were later domesticated. <coughs> and these may have been triggered by sparks from human fires or even used deliberately to create favoured hunting grounds. And there's also evidence in the pollen record from Lake Zerabar here of vegetation disturbance which perhaps represents the very earliest traces of um, cultivation at around 8,000 BC. So as uh, Roger mentioned, it's a very biodiverse region, and many sites were founded on environmental boundaries that offered access to a range <coughs> of resources as well and uh, biodiverse food webs. So in particular, uh, in the wetland regions, um, 
there are, the animals that were here later domesticated include the wild pig, as well as um, fish and river clams, for example. In the fertile soils, these were also the habitat for the cereals and pulses, such as barley and wheat and chickpea, which were also later domesticated. And in the hills and mountains, this was the wild habitat of goat and sheep, um, as well as a range of um, fruit and um, nut trees, for example. So the, the question is, when, where, and how were particular species domesticated, however? <laughs> It's now widely recognized that there were multiple centers of domestication and that hunter-gatherers have had an impact on crop evolution for more than 30,000 years as they selected for particular strains, such as those with large grains. And um, selection for um, cereals, where the seeds didn't uh, fall off as you harvested them, was particularly strong around 8,000 BC, which is a critical point in agriculture. But throughout this period, it's recognized that there's a complex mosaic of wild and cultivated crops and interbreeding between them. There's um, DNA and other um, uh, evidence from the archaeobotany to suggest that the Zagros was a center for barley domestication and its eastward spread with farming populations. In looking at the history of a particular site, I wanted to uh, look at Sheikhibad, as this enables study of the history of domestication over 2,200 years. And it's been studied by Dr. Jade Whitlam with the um, Oxford Archaeobotany team, led by <coughs> Professor Amy Bogart, and held by uh, Hengami Okhani Mogadam. So what's evident at this site, which was founded right at the start of the change of environment, is that there was a focus on plant collection of medium-seeded wild grasses. These, however, didn't end up in the Neolithic package and were only being auditioned at this point. <coughs> Currently, because of the limit of excavations, we jump now to 8,000 uh, BC, and this is when there are traces of domesticated barley and wheat, as well as um, pulses and fruits and nuts, and there's likely to have been year-round settlement based on a very diverse um, base. But just 400 years later, the, this diversity is very much reduced, and there's a focus simply on the domesticated crop package. And this is very much the uh, trend today. So already, as early as this, there was a um, um, sort of focus on monocrops and a loss of biodiversity in our diets. So in animal domestication, it's also recognized that there were multiple centers of domestication and a complex evolution. Here are just some of the potential centers for domestication of different animals. And at the Central Zagros Archaeological Project, Dr. Robin Bendry is the zoo archaeologist based at the University of Edinburgh. And in looking at pathways to domestication, these uh, can begin with the selection of particular prey, for example, in hunting and then increasing management, for example, in um, selective hunting of um, males, for example, to increase the breeding population. And then there's domestication, when animals are actually brought into environments and moved to other environments, as well as their breeding cycles controlled. And it's recognized that throughout this process, again, there's lots of interbreeding and extinctions. So at the moment, it's a very complex and fast evolving picture with new sites being excavated, but also new ADNA evidence uh, changing the picture with uh, publications coming out this year um, to add to this all the time. And we're conducting our own analyses to help with this. Robin's work has shown from study of the animal bones on site that there's very much hunting and management of animals in their local habitats. So in the highlands of Iran, the main focus is on goat in their native habitat where they were domesticated. In the foothills, in the Piedmont region, the focus is on sheep, and it's, potential, it's possible that there was an independent domestication of sheep in this region. Down on the steppe um, in Iraq, however, the focus was on gazelle, and this was an animal that was never domesticated. So there are multiple different root ways in the animals that are selected and ways in which they're uh, domesticated. So goats are one of the most adaptable um, animals that, um, uh, and are spread across the globe. But as I say, they were domesticated partly in the Zagros region. And the steps in this were management in their native habitat 
up around Sheikh Ibad and Ganjdari by 8000 BC. By um, 7600, there's evidence of goats being moved out of this native habitat down into the uh, foothill regions. And by 7000 BC, uh, goat is the preferred dominant domesticate in other regions. The DNA picture for goat is currently a jigsaw with missing pieces in a recent article and it's been stated just about to come out. But there is some evidence to suggest that uh, there's independent uh, domestication here in the Zagros. But in many ways, it's not looking for the first um, domestication that's so important. It's looking at how people adapted during these major transformations in lifestyle. So my last section of the talk, which is um, larger than this one, is to look at the early settled life. And um, how did people become settled and sedentary, which is very much the foundation of our lives today. So many sites um, in the, um, uh, were known from visits by hunter-gatherers before they became fully-fledged settlements. And at Gangjo, for example, there's evidence of hearths and storage <coughs> pits in a communal area where goat and was cooked, and there are nuts as well. And this communal space suggests that food was shared, as is common in many hunter-gatherer societies today. Some of the earliest buildings um, are at the site of Zawi Chemi Shanadar in the Zagros region, and these are very small, at only two to five meters in uh, diameter would have only enabled small-scale activities and social interactions within in them. Significantly, however, houses were built one on top of the other, suggesting continuity and um, particular associations with plots and particular places and sites, um, and associations that ultimately led to greater sedentism. However, in these early periods in particular, open areas were very important and um, were used for a range of craft and food production, and in particular, the discovery of 15 skulls of wild goat and sheep and 17 large bird wings, which uh, may well have been from ritual paraphernalia, were found in an open area around a building with red ochre. And we can imagine some of these uh, rituals going on in these early sites, also creating associations with place. The greatest transformations in the built environment and settled life um, occurred from 8,500 BC. And at this point, buildings become increasingly rectilinear and larger in size. This um, rectilinearity, even though a bit irregular here, did enable buildings to be packed much closer together with these complex agglomerated communities. One of the largest uh, buildings in this region is indeed from the Central Zagros Archaeological Project site of Best Ansur, around 7,600 uh, BC. And this building is one of the largest um, in the region, and indeed is much larger than buildings at the famous site of Jarmo and Chatelhuyev a thousand years later. What's significant is that ovens and storage, instead of being in communal areas, are being increasingly enclosed. There's a greater privatization of food and uh, food production, and, um, which is suggestive of social divisions which are um, identified across the Middle East at this moment with greater focus on households as a fundamental social unit. And households indeed are the fundamental social unit today. So again, this is something to which we can look back to the origins of in this region. Braidwood, however, when he was excavating Jarmo, uh, commented, we have no really good evidence that might specify the use to which various rooms in the house were put as few artifacts were left on floors. And this is true on many archaeological sites. Unless there's a disaster, um, there's, uh, artifacts are often removed and taken elsewhere before a house is abandoned. But if you can imagine in this uh, photograph of a house from the Zagros region, if we remove the artifacts, what's left? And I think you'll begin to see that there are a range of clues as to the use um, of the built environment and the activities conducted by settled communities. <coughs> So once we take away the artifacts, for example, the architecture itself is clearly providing shelter, as well as defining the boundaries and spaces for particular activities. So we as archaeologists can look at social and economic organization 
by measuring things like the, and, and mapping the spatial organization and access pathways. We can measure space size and its form and view sheds and ways in which it's connected to look at the nature and scale of social interaction and the types of activities that might have been carried out within them. But if we look again, we can see that there are various installations that are left. There are storage bins, and in many areas there are ovens, for example, so the features themselves are more fixed and can help inform on place. But ethnoarchaeologists highlighted that the very surfaces and construction materials and residues on the floors themselves provide one of the most informative records as to use of space and activities. And here, for example, we can see that in courtyards, there are very few prepared surfaces. And in an animal pen, it's layers of compacted animal dung. And as we get closer into the house, there's more whitewash on the walls, for example. And within the interiors, there's often multiple layers of whitewash, and they were kept extremely clean. So that as archaeologists, we can begin to look at this scale of analysis to reconstruct buildings and their um, life of those who occupied them. And my own specialist expertise, which Steve mentioned, is indeed the study of such surfaces and the residues on them by cutting out blocks such as these, soaking them in resin, and making them into large glass thin sections such as these. And these provide us with a very fine resolution um, under the microscope. Many layers are paper thin. And indeed, these provide almost like the leaves of a book through the past history of particular places and buildings and settlements. <coughs> And here at Reading, we're one of the few um, places with a laboratory and training centre for these studies in micromorphology. And I hope that uh, we'll show today just how the very sediments in archaeological sites are teeming with evidence and can be studied by a range of interdisciplinary uh, techniques and specialists. So in looking at the histories of settled life of individual sites, for example, in these basal layers at Sheikhabad, there's evidence of periodic visits from hunter-gatherers with laid gravel surfaces and accumulations of burnt aggregates and bones um, and organic materials. And as we jump forward in time to 8000 BC, there's actually substantial architecture, <coughs> evidence of year-round settlement and in-situ burning, for example. And we can see under the microscope that there's fragile traces of um, ashes of nuts, but also of animal dung fuel and I'll show you how we identify that, as well as traces of figurines suggesting ritual. Indeed, at the very latest level of the site, we uncovered, to our surprise, a ritual building, which has got four large, wild um, skulls of goat and one of sheep, some with red ochre placed on them. And this is in a place which is up to four metres in diameter and would have enabled more social-scale interactions and is likely to have been a ritual building actually made from mi miniature bricks as well. It's separated off from this domestic building with much smaller rooms. Well, to our surprise, we also um, identified lots of traces of animal dung all around in the other areas of the settlement, in the open areas, as well as multiple layers of animal dung in this small room here, suggesting this was an animal pen, perhaps sheltering animals during the winter, for example. And animal dung is difficult to identify, but uh, we've developed a range of techniques which includes um, portable x-ray fluorescence to look for high phosphorus concentrations. We can look at spot samples in the field to look for dung spherulites, as well as cut out blocks. And look at the um, silica glass uh, plant remains found within them, such as grasses or trees, for example, and look at the diet of animals and how they were managed. With gas chromatography, you can identify the species, in this case, ruminants such as um, goat. That this building was also lived in is suggested by the fact that there are lots of multiple layers of plaster floor, traces of pottery and charred plants from food, but that an infant is buried below the floors. And in each of these areas where there's different sediments, there's remarkable repetition, suggesting social continuity and stability in these early villages. And looking at the evolution of um, one site, um, we had an extraordinary insight from this 60-metre section through the mound of Jani in the lower Zagros. Here we were able to look at transitions between phases and were surprised to find that these are often extremely abrupt and sharp. 
In the earliest levels of the site here, there's periodic traces of hunter-gatherer fires associated with burnt aggregates and bone and charred wood, <coughs> uh, typical remains from hunter-gatherer fires today. There's a dramatic increase in the intensity of occupation with very well-preserved surfaces, perhaps from hut floors, and lots of accumulated ashes, which, if it wasn't rapidly accumulating, would have blown away. Importantly, there's evidence of access to animal dung, suggesting animals were nearby, and that it was the um, working larder, if you like, and resources of having animals that enabled sedentism. There's also a marked change later in the site, when there was this um, substantial architecture constructed of um, but strange boat-shaped mud bricks, which are found across the Near East in Turkey as well, and as we'll see, there's technological um, knowledge exchange across this large region. The floors were plastered multiple times in white, also like buildings in Turkey. And it suggests a focus on interior space and um, the important social roles and relations within that, as well as continuity. So in my last case study, I want to look at the site of Bestansur in Iraq, 7600 BC. And to our surprise, this site, although it's complex, doesn't have the classic Neolithic crop package of cereals. There are very few cereals. Um, and legumes. By contrast, there's um, a very biodiverse diet, not unlike so-called paleo diets today, when there's lot evidence of um, consumption of snails, water birds, crab, as well as fish, in addition to wild sheep and managed goat. And that the fish were actually consumed is attested by our finds in looking at human coprolites, or poo, which we find a lot on these sites and in fact a very rich source of evidence both on diet, here in this case, fish bone, as well as wild plants, but also on health, as there are a range of microbial traces which we're um, developing and informing on the, the complex composition of deposits. So in settlement organization, um, in seven trenches we found architecture, and strikingly, all of the architecture was on the same alignment, suggesting settlement-wide organization and collaboration. There's also specialist areas, for example, for shell middens and animal butchery. The architecture is remarkably sophisticated from 10,000 years ago and is one of the reasons this site's been placed on the UNESCO World Heritage List. Um, the mud brick walls would have provided thermal insulation from the extreme heat and cold. There was waterproof clays used for green roofing material and fired lime, which is a high degree of pyrotechnology in external areas. And perhaps, and there's gravel perhaps to stop um, rodents from burrowing into the walls. The earliest elaborate building uh, was um, plastered multiple times and also painted. And uh, a, ma a ma master student in chemistry has established that these green clays were made from celadonite, later used for 5,000 years by Egyptians as a base for their wall paintings. We hope that upon excavation, the uh, wall paintings may be as elaborate as these um, dancing figures from the site of Halula, as the plans at this site are very similar to those at Best Ansur. The later building was built on the same uh, area, but enlarged considerably, <coughs> and uh, was marked by elaborate carved stones in its entrance, other finds such as the mace head and figurines. And within the oven, there were traces of human bone and large bird bone, again, a wing bone, perhaps from uh, ritual um, artifacts. So uh, there were also 72 people, importantly, buried below the floors of this building and counting. So a big question is, was this a house of the dead or a house of the living? And Dr. Ingrid Ebertson, using microarchaeology, has shown that building five was kept very clean. But this isn't unusual. Many buildings were kept clean with few traces of bone, for example. In the field, we look very closely at the sections to look at different um, types of activities and uses of space, and we're able to find traces of woven floor mats. But when we look under the microscope, we can see a lot more information. And we can see that the plaster in the entranceway was a very tough plaster and resistant to trampling. The interior was plastered with very fine plasters, only about a millimeter thick, and kept extremely clean with lots of traces of matting on them. One of the traces we are finding is traces of red pigment, which is often associated with ritual activities. The only evidence of food is from burnt microfauna and fish uh, found in this area close to the entrance. In the oven, we found lots of traces of reeds and grass, 
and it's tempting su to suggest this might represent matting and wrappings from the burials. The cleanliness of this building is in great contrast to external areas where the sediments are full of things like burnt bone, burnt shell and oven rake out and the high temperature dung fuel, bits of um, burnt aggregates, but lots of debris from stone working and chip stone. So I'll pass you back to Roger and he'll explore with you the burials and the rich material artifacts. Thank you. So we have quite a lot of human remains, and they're enable, they enable us to address questions about demography, diet, health, and well-being. At Sheikh Ibad, we have about half a dozen skeletons from adults, adults to children. And the key thing here is the teeth. The teeth tell us that these are essentially still hunters. So although they have domesticated animals and plants in some quantities, they're still doing a lot of hunting, and their diet has an impact. We don't have time to go into the details, but it does have a direct impact on what happens to the teeth. And these are still hunter's teeth. But let's move to Best Ansor, where we've been, as Wendy's mentioned, excavating buildings that have lots of human burials under their floors. This is a typical Neolithic practice, to bury the dead under the floors of buildings. What is not so typical is the sheer quantities of burials we are getting out of these buildings. When he said we're up to at least 72 individuals, and we think there are many more, in particular in this room here. And these burials come in a range of forms. Some of them are complete articulated individuals. Others are groups of skulls that have clearly been buried, perhaps buried elsewhere and then brought here for final deposition. And there are other arrangements of bones. Very much drawing here on the work of Dr. Sam Walsh, who's our project uh, osteoarchaeologist. The sequence of burials in these buildings is quite complex and is taking us a long time to disentangle as we excavate them. The earliest deposits are underlying the buildings in foundation deposits, and these consist of scatters of, or, or rather clusters of bones. You can see a cluster of bones here, MNI standing for minimum number of individuals. There are at least three individuals here attested. Uh, adult, adolescent, and infant, and we have a very vivid red staining on some of the bones, which may be applied directly to the bones after the flesh has been removed or, 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 or eroded off, decayed off, or may be coming from painted objects that are in the tomb and that have since degraded, like uh, baskets or matting or whatever. We're not sure about that. Then we have burials that are in pits that have been cut through the floors from higher up, uh, when the building is in use. Most of our burials are like that. And these again are complex clusters of bones, including groups of skulls. Uh, others are complete and articulated individuals. If we look at this group, there's at least 11 individuals here, eight of them adults. We've got lots of skulls, you can see them all here. But there are two fully articulated individuals, a young child here and an even smaller child here. Uh, these groups here, there's a group of at least 12 individuals, 11 of them are less than two years old. So a lot of young, young individuals buried in this building. And we have evidence for reed matting. We think some of these groups of skulls or bones are actually in mat baskets or containers that are then being placed in pits in the ground, filled back in and then covered over uh, until, uh, until the next burial is placed in. So it's a very complex sequence of burials going on here. Buried with these individuals are some uh, artifacts, in particular beads. We have hundreds of beads, frequently in shell, limestone, and clay, but also more rarely in exotic materials like carnelian and chalcedony, uh, which are coming from outside this region. This is not local to Bestensor. It's coming from the Iranian highlands or even from Afghanistan to the east. We also have shells from the sea, and we're a long way from the sea, such as cowrie shells, which we think are probably being used like they are at the famous uh, Jericho skull. This one is in the museum in Oxford, the Ashmolean, and dates roughly to the same period, where they would have been set into the eyes, perhaps representing sl sleep or death, uh, and with the skull plastered. We have a little bit of evidence for plastering of bones as well. So what kind of uh, demography can we get at through these individuals? Well, there's a very high proportion of juveniles, less than 18-year-olds, um, roughly three-quarters of them. And a great number of them are very young indeed. As you can see, there's a peak here at one to two years old. 
um, only uh, a small proportion of adults. Um, now, the question is, how, what can this tell us about the structure of the population at the time? There have to be some provisos here, because it may be that they're burying adults in other buildings, and we're only getting a, you know, a biased sample here. But if we, just for the sake of argument, assume it is representative of, of a, a kind of true death profile, as it were, then we do fit quite well with something called the agricultural demographic transition put forward by a French uh, physical anthropologist, Bocquet d'Appel. And his argument is that essentially as people settle down, change their diet, take on more calories and more nutrient-rich foods from cereals and dairy products and meat, um, women essentially are capable of producing more children in their fertile lifespan. And indeed that lifespan expands as well. So that typically hunter-gatherer groups, women produce four, five, six children in their lifespan. With settled farming communities, that goes up to 10, 12, 15. At the same time, there's a whole range of new opportunities for diseases to, to develop because you've got people crowded together, you've got people living with animals, so you have so-called zoonotic diseases, diseases that jump from animals to people, like brucellosis, like measles, mumps, uh, and many other diseases are actually jumping from animals to people. And now that people are spending much more time with animals and with each other and in larger communities, the whole scope for diseases, pathogens and bacteria to spread is enormously increased. And this may be having a significant if impact on infant mortality, but it's more than compensated for by the increased fertility or fecundity, perhaps better. This has been discussed quite nicely in James Scott's new book, Against the Grain, where he calls this a perfect epidemiological storm, these various factors coming together at the Neolithic. Now, we can't track many of these diseases on our bones because they tend to have quite a dramatic and sudden effect. If you get one of these diseases, you can die quite quickly before it's had a chance to impact your bones. What we do get are more chronic ailments, such as uh, malnutrition uh, and dietary um, deficiency, which shows in a range of our uh, uh, features on bones, things like cribra orbitalia, which uh, impacts the skull and which indicates malnutrition. The same with parotid hyperostosis, which you see here again on skull and other bones. And on teeth, we get something called linear enamel hyperplasia, which uh, almost half of our adults have that, and many of the children as well. How tall were people in the Neolithic? Um, well, Wendy and I are actually fairly typical Neolithic male and female size, as it happens. So we could actually look them in the eye uh, fairly steadily, and that, perhaps that's why we're so drawn to them. <laughs> now, DNA is something we're um, got. We're, uh, sadly, we don't have our DNA results for this lecture. We were very much hoping we did. We've got 17 of our humans currently at the ADNA, Ancient DNA Lab at University College Dublin. And we're expecting results imminently. It's going to be really exciting, if, provided we do get some kind of results that are clear. Because our sites are here. This map is essentially showing that on you, you, the two triangles are Neolithic sites. You've got a Neolithic cave in western Iran, a Neolithic mounded site in western Turkey. And then you've got modern populations in the circles. The colors correlate, obviously, with the diamonds very, very strongly and support an argument of the just a significant impact on the spread of humans with farming. Now, this, uh, it's actually quite complex, but, but the, there is this stark contrast in the spread of farming eastwards into Central Asia and South Asia, which actually does involve some significant population movement, as well as, of course, movement of the animals and the crops involved, because they are not indigenous in these other areas, most of them. And the same, but uh, from another source, of the spread of the Neolithic westwards across Europe into North Africa and ultimately into Britain as well. So it's a, it's a twofold process and arguments that some people still cling to that the Neolithic just starts in one place and everyone spreads out from there. Really the DNA is not supporting that. It's suggesting quite, quite a significant sort of bifurcation really. Now, I'm going to end with, uh, or not, not quite end, but uh, we're going to spend a few minutes looking at the material networks of the Neolithic, here drawing very much on Dr. Amy Richardson's work with material, materiality of the Neolithic. 
using many techniques, but one of the most informative is portable X-ray fluorescence. This is using the machine that you see Amy using here in the field to provide an elemental characterization of artifacts, as well as deposits. This can be used very flexibly. And this enables us to look at how materials are moving around. And Amy's map here shows, obviously we're getting use of local resources like clays and cherts and flints and limestones and so on. But there's also a lot of movement. As we've already explained, things like carnelian, cowrie shells, seashells, but also obsidian, which is a volcanic glass, and we have no volcanoes near us. This is coming from significant distances away. And Amy's work is able to characterize not just the precise volcano that this obsidian is coming from, but the actual slope on the volcano where the obsidian is coming from. This, of course, if we want to think about what people were doing in the Neolithic, I mean, we know they were starting to tend crops, they were sowing seeds, uh, uh, weeding, watering, harvesting, and so on. But they were still doing a lot of other things. They were still doing a lot of hunting in this transitional episode that lasts for several thousand years. And they were undertaking all sorts of craft activities. One of their major activities was using groundstone tools, as studied by Dr. David Mudd here at Reading. Um, making mace heads, quite high status, we make a uh, take a lot of work to make one of these. Grindstones for grinding grain, for making flour. They didn't have pottery, they're not using pottery at all. Pottery comes along a little bit later. They're using a lot of perishable things, of course, which we only find faint traces of, baskets, mats, and so on. They're fishing with nets uh, weighted by stones. They've got stones that they're using for working, perhaps working leather and so on for clothing. And they're also using a lot of flint and obsidian tools. This is really the commonest material that we find. And they're using, as I say, locally available flints, but also obsidian. And they have quite specific uses that they put these materials to. And Amy's work, as I say, shows that our obsidian is coming from at least 500 kilometers away near Lake Van, and some of it, small amounts, coming from even further away in central Turkey as well. So what kind of tools are they actually using? Well, they are, they are using sickle blades. They're making sickle blades out of flint, locally available. These would be blades that would be set into a haft made of bone or, or wood, which doesn't survive unless it gets charred. There are one or two examples from other sites. We have a fragment of one here. We have traces of bitumen, which is a tarry substance locally available, which is used as a glue to set these blades into the haft. And you can see that in the graph of the chart here, through time, there's increasing use of sickles as people do more and more farming, essentially, through time. They're using them for crops, but also for harvesting reeds and rushes. We have very fine pointed tools. They're drilling and piercing um, things like, uh, again, leather, but also uh, beads, uh, using quite fine uh, brill, uh, uh, drill points to drill into beads. And we've got, as I mentioned, loads of those in the burials. They're hunting with bows and arrows and using very fine, rather like British Mesolithic um, microliths set into bone and wooden um, arrow shafts as points and barbs, all made using the so-called pressure technique. This is napping using the pressure of shoulder or chest to, uh, to knock little blades off a core. And with obsidian, they're do, making a range of specialist tools, including these tools called Chayanu tools, after the site of Chayanu in southeast Turkey, where they were first identified. These are quite thick blades, which you can just make out these striations here, which are actually use wear. These tools are used, and various studies have, I think, fairly convincingly established this, used for finishing off marble alabaster objects, quite high status items, like these flanged bracelets which we usually find only in small fragments. And what's quite interesting here is that we, at two sites where we've got Chinu tools, Best Ansur on the left and Shimshara on the right, they're making them in slightly different ways and using them in different ways too. So there are quite distinctive regional traditions. They're doing the same thing ultimately, but they've got their own little ways of doing it. So we can see schools or traditions of craft and technology developing through this period. <coughs> And we also have a lot, quite a lot of clay objects, uh, little figurines, rather strange amorphous shapes, but also things that we think might be significant as tokens. These are 
cones, discs, spheres, truncated cones. We find them at many Neolithic sites, including our own. We know in later periods that these serve as essentially tallies for people keeping tabs on things like the herds of animals they have. If they're assigning a herd of their animals to a shepherd to take off to seasonal pastures, they want to know how many animals are involved, so they exchange tokens to represent that. We know that in later periods, and that actually leads on to writing much later, uh, about 3200 BC, in South Iraq. Now, um, we don't know if that's what they're doing with these, but it, it is possible that they are using these as some kind of representational system of keeping tally of animals, sacks of grain, whatever. So I want to end just for a couple of minutes thinking about possible future directions. We want to do a huge amount more on these sites, um, and the, it's very slow excavating. We uh, need many, many more years, if God grants them, to, to work on these sites. We have just put in a major application to the European Research Council. Steve helped us a, a great deal with that, and other colleagues here. For five years' work at the two sites of Sheikh Yabad and Bestan, so we find out the results of that early next year. But with or without that, we plan to keep on working at these sites. We need much larger trenches so that we can get an idea about neighborhoods and um, how representative the buildings are that we've excavated. We also want to go to, back to a site called Zazi, which is a cave rock shelter site excavated some time ago because this predates the Neolithic. It's really the height of the hunter-gatherer lifestyle. And we need to find out more about the circumstances, the environment, the climate in the centuries and millennia prior to the transition into the Neolithic. Um, and we have the cave site to excavate, but also in our own survey across the valley, we have a nice open air site where perhaps we can look at seasonal mobility and so on in the, in the very late Paleolithic. We're also expanding our program of public engagement. We work a lot with schools, universities, villages, and government bodies in the region. Uh, including the local museum in Sleimani, the, the, the local town in Iraqi Kurdistan, where we've got plans to help them, and, and Rhys Smith's been helping us a great deal with this, and other colleagues uh, redo the prehistory gallery in this museum. This gallery was recently redone with a UNESCO grant. We want to do a, a similar sort of thing with the prehistory gallery. We also want to make the case for full nomination, the, uh, nomination to the full list of best answer of the UNESCO World Heritage, uh, system, which is a, a major task for the for the next few years ahead. And uh, I hope that we've been able to show through this talk that um, if we want to explore the origins of farming and how we've ended up in the situation that we are in uh, today, we do have to go back a very long way and to look at the challenges, a disruptive episode of change that people went through 12, 11, 10,000 years ago and think about the ways that they addressed that and the complexities they faced and the answers that they came up with. Because we are, it's arguably, in, in a similar kind of disruptive episode. And um, I think there are lessons to be learned from studying the past. I hope you've enjoyed the talk. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, I have no doubt you'll agree with me that's been an absolutely astounding lecture, the way that Roger and Wendy can move from those big global issues, how have we come into the modern world from that hunter-gatherer beginning, and then take us down to the micro-details of individual lives that you see from that sort of evidence coming from the house floors. It's, it's truly phenomenal, truly phenomenal research. We have time for some questions, and I'm sure there are many, many questions. So, um, you're going to have to choose who takes the question, really. I, <laughs> well, you know, let's see what the question is. See, see what you see. I guess you want to ask one of them in particular, but they are team, so we'll see. But, sir, so, you're first. There's a microphone coming. Yes, there's, there's some microphones coming. Hi, Roger. Um, thank you for the talk. We determine the dates absolutely by radiocarbon uh, accelerated mass spectrometry dating, which is, is reasonably 
reasonably accurate, um, depending on what it is we're dating. Um, but we, we have plenty of material to date for human remains, um, animal bones, charred seeds. That what sort of uncertainty, what sort of precision do you it, get? It varies, but it can be plus or minus 50, 60, 100, typically, um, at that, at that uh, time depth. Any other independent sources besides reading carbon? Yes, well, there are the... Is that me? Or? The style of the stone tools is reasonably specific. You can bring it down to, you know, this type of stone tool is only found after such and such a date and not found before such and such a date. And using the multiple artifact sources, we can narrow it down reasonably, but, it, but not as accurately, accurately as the radiometric data. Thank you. Yes. yes. Hello. Thank you very much for the very interesting talk. You're um, excuse my ignorance. Um, how do you know that it's exactly domestication and it's not that you have uh, hunter gatherers that are gathering a lot of material and storing the material? Well, certainly with cereals, one of the things that happens is that um, they select for cereal grains where when you harvest them, the seeds don't fall off. So it's actually, and then they, we also know that these, are, that these then become totally dependent on humans. They're not naturally scattering the grain. They have to then be replanted annually by humans. So this is like the ultimate domestication process. But in all of these, there are various... Um, uh, steps along the way, and also some, you know, some, spe some lines go out of um, cultivation, and uh, it's a very complex genetic map. But it's that sort of control over breeding, or uh, that, that makes domestication. And when it comes to animals, uh, if you find an animal outside its natural habitat, um, in other words, in an area where it wouldn't survive because it would be predated, uh, for example, goat, wild goat are at home in the high mountains and they can escape, escape predators there. If you find them in foothill regions with humans, they are certainly being controlled, managed, protected, and well on the way to domestication, if not actual domestication. But it's a very good question because a key issue is um, morphologically identifying domestication is actually quite complex and there seems to be a significant time lag between de facto domestication and the morphological manifestation of domestication of perhaps a thousand years or so. You also mentioned the disease. Oh, I don't know if this is... Yeah, the I can hear you. The disease yeah. of uh, the earliest uh, findings... Uh, of humans. Of humans from yeah. the Yes, that... They didn't have cavities. That's one thing. That, I mean, the, the, the state of, uh, I didn't mention, but the state of the, the teeth in the Best and Saw burials, 7,600 BC or so, it is pretty bad. I mean, there's a lot of tooth loss, a lot of caries, abscesses, oral health is, it, it's, it's pretty bad. Um, with the earlier um, skeletons, the, the teeth, uh, what happens to teeth is essentially that as people become farmers and eat more grain, um, they are grinding um, cereals to make grain and tiny chips of stone get mixed in with the grain and that wears teeth down over, over a fairly short time span actually. Uh, and hunters don't have that of course because they're not, they're not grinding grain. Can I ask two more questions? Uh, well, no, let's, let's move, let's move okay. somewhere else now. Thank you so much. I think there's a question at the back. Um, my question is about building materials. Um, what sort of building materials were they using? And is there evidence of the use of animal products other than dung, you know, such as blood or tissues and that sort of thing, to, to enhance the strength of these buildings? We haven't identified that yet, but certainly they were firing lime, which uh, to temperatures of 750, 850 centigrade to make the very hard plaster floors and very durable surfaces, um, which are also very antimicrobial, for example. 
but um, adding dung itself to some of the white plaster floors, dung ash, also leads to a sort of a, a harder floor plaster in itself as a sort of biomineralization process. But certainly there's scope for you doing things like gas chromatography to look for traces of organic residues in the plasters themselves. Um, but um, I know you, in your own research, are, are very much found um, exciting ways forward in earthen materials, which concrete has to be fired and it has a huge carbon footprint. So I think there's a lot of scope for experimenting with earthen architecture today as um, a good building material. It's also very healthy to live in because it uh, breathes, for example. So uh, very important field. Mm -hmm. Thank, you. Thank you. Yes, lady. And then, and then you sir afterwards in front. Then a bit of a follow-on from the previous question. Uh, when you, towards the end, you were talking about the plaster walls, yeah. which you were saying was evidence of uh, misted, something that deters rodents. Yes, that was where um, there's um, traces of gravel in the packing all around the interior of the room with the burials, and this. Um, uh, I haven't seen any parallels for, except someone did say that um, I believe in some architecture today, earthen architecture, people will lay glass around because we often know that mice like to run along the walls, and that's a sort of their safe area, if you like. So it's possible that because it's an interior space, that that's what this was for. When you say glass, do you mean sort of ground up? Or yeah, no, the shards of glass. So in other words, if a mouse is trying to bury oh, in it. And sure. in fact, mice are very interesting because as people settle down, mice uh, join them. And um, yes. the house mouse became a huge um, threat. You know, it damages the stores, it causes disease. And in fact, there's some breaking news that um, mice might have been domesticated back in the late Paleolithic, you know, because there is some evidence of um, sedentism. Fiona Marshall from St. Louis, so 13, 15,000 so years ago. So gravel that you mentioned, isn't yes. it? Yes, yes. That would be sort of sharp gravel. It's fairly sharp, but at least they couldn't burrow through it, <coughs> is, is one possibility. <laughs> it's, a, it's a hypothesis at the moment, but it's, I've never seen it before, and uh, that was one explanation suggested. <coughs> Thank you. I think the gentleman in front of you had a... Sorry, you may not have been in your talk because I'm afraid I was a bit late. Um, were these people modern homo sapiens? I mean, were they more or less as we are with very much so, comparable yes. capabilities? I mean, I don't mean technical capabilities because things haven't been developed, but I mean the intellectual. No, ones. no difference, but really. Right. Okay. No. Thank you. Right. And there's another one back there. Thank you very much for a wonderful lecture. <coughs> well, one, uh, one thing you mentioned was the use of rectilinear builds, which suggests like a, an attempt to make efficient use of space, which suggests um, perhaps a, a, a considerable population density. Can you think about the population density or sort of how, much, how many people can be supported by, say, a square mile of land or...? <coughs> Yes, there are various population figures. It's, um, we haven't actually done the math yet for that, partly because there are so many open areas um, on this site. Um, and the very densely packed settlement I showed you, they think might be some of the storage areas. But you're absolutely right, they're packing them together. Interestingly, they're also building them against each other. Um, and that would have helped with insulation against heat and cold, for example, with stability. Um, but also, as you say, it's part of this demographic transition um, and it's easier to fit together. So thank you very much. Now we've had lots of questions from the back. I'm going to ask one myself from the front because I, I, I do f worry that you've been skipping a big issue here. Um, you gave us a lovely example of these hunter gatherers here and they had a huge diverse food, diverse food diet. They were fishing, they were plants, great food diversity. And I think Wendy showed us how they went to almost to a monoculture, a mono diet later on. And what you told about the diseases, the infant death and so forth. So why on earth do they do this? Why on earth have you got this transition from living with hunter gathering to living with farming? Because it doesn't look like a very good idea to me. <laughs> well, uh, as you know, Steve, the why question is the hardest one. <laughs> <laughs> I know you're giving the lecture, so <laughs> <laughs> Well, 
If we look actually at the spread of farming out of these core regions, it's very episodic, and people clearly are, whether reluctant is the right word, they're not rushing to become farmers. If we look at the spread of farming across Turkey, for example, it's in a series of jumps. Uh, with gaps of a thousand years, fifteen hundred years before it then jumps to the next area. And you can imagine actually that these farming areas are surrounded by hunter-gatherer groups who are clearly saying, not for me, thank you, I'm quite happy hunting my animals and sitting around the campfire every night and telling lots of stories and what have you. The farming life is hard and as you, uh, as, as you rightly remind us, the, uh, the health, health plummets why it's happening, I, I don't believe we have a convincing answer. There's, there's certainly a question of entanglement, and this is not all about what humans are intending to do. There is, there is no teleology involved. Humans do not really know what they're letting themselves in for. And it's, a, it's an evolutionary partnership, you know, an, an, an unwitting partnership, I think one could say, between humans and the other species involved, animals and plants. And when you think, it, think of it in evolutionary terms, then domestication for goat, for example, is great. It means that goat can now live in areas where they simply could not live before. They get help with birthing, with breeding, with feeding. Everything's fine. The only thing they give up is the manner and timing of their own death. Well, that doesn't mean anything in evolutionary terms. So, you know, there is an evolutionary answer that this is actually a fantastic system, including for us, although, you know, th there are these tremendous downsides, we still are nevertheless now capable of supporting a, a planetary population of 7.6 billion, which is utterly unthinkable without agriculture. So there's an evolutionary answer to that question, <coughs> but I don't think there's a logical one. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Roger. We've got time for a couple more questions, yes. Any evidence for active water management in this part of the world? Not really, no. Uh, it's a good question. Um, we are, our early, earliest convincing evidence for that comes in at about 6000 BC, where in both Iran and Iraq there's evidence for water channels that are feeding water from rivers through artificial channels onto fields, <laughs> almost certainly. But prior to that, no. And actually what we didn't mention was that both the two sites, the one in the High Zagros, the one in Low Zagros, are close to natural springs. And Best Ansor in particular, today has an incredibly prolific spring that feeds, or waters rather, um, many villages on the plain. And it's clearly an ancient spring as well. And we can see where the ancient spring heads are around the plain. Um, and that's clearly a factor in the location uh, of the site and later period sites as well, right up to the modern village. Yes, just to add to that, um, I would like to have shown us a site which shows the, the mounds that dotted around this spring through time, including in the imperial periods, you know, um, 900, 500 BC, for example. And we did geophysics around the site, and in fact there we did find a huge canal leading from the spring to one of the Assyrian sites, but that's much later in time. But I suspect there would have been local management of water, um, you know, whether for, say, fishing, for example, um, that sort of thing, but also crops if it's easy just to dig it or let it uh, flood, for example. The small scale steps, I'm sure. Thank you. One more question? Yes, sir. Hello. Um, again, sorry, I wasn't here earlier. Um, have you any evidence of organized religion or religion of any kind? Religion is difficult. We have evidence of cultic behavior, but, um, and in particular through these very complex, multi-stage ways of treating the dead. And we must imagine there is some kind of system of belief behind all of that. Very, very difficult for us to articulate what that might be, but arguably having something to do with laying claim to place as people settle down, building up ancestry, uh, through complex ways of treating previous generations and their dead. Um, but beyond that, re really difficult to, to get at any specifics in terms of organized <coughs> religion. But certainly organized, structured, uh, cultic behavior is clear. Thank you. Now, um, ladies and gentlemen, 
We must finish now. Before we give our final appreciation to Roger and Wendy, let me um, just note that our next lecture in this series is on the 28th of February. It's next year, 2018. And it's going to be concerned with the fight against dementia. Now, this evening, um, we've heard a remarkable lecture from Roger and Wendy describing their work. When they began this evening, they noted that our ideas of Iran and Iraq are today so often formed through the images that we see on television and hear in the news. And they said they were going to give us another vision of an Iran and Iraq. I think that they've done that brilliantly. Not only of those remarkable landscapes, but also of the academics, the students, the people they're working with there, and that very rich collaboration of the UK and the Iranian Iraqan teams, and how they're contributing to both. And when we, when we give them our final applause in a moment, I think we should be doing that, not just for the lecture, but also for the great contribution that they're making towards the cultural heritage of these, these areas. You've heard about the public engagement and the contributions they're making developing new museums and bringing this archaeology, this information about an Iraq and, and, and Iran to the, to the wider world. So, Roger Wendy, well done and thank you for a wonderful lecture.